So in this video, I'm going to give you an introduction to the mechanics module of maths and look at some of the key skills you're going to need before you get started looking at specific topics. The first thing you need to know is how to describe the difference between a vector and a scalar. So, to give you an example of what I mean by this, you'll have come across distance before. Now, distance is a scalar. And it's a scalar because it gives you no indication of the direction in which the distance is. So if I told you an object is moved by 2 metres and moved by another 2 metres, I've given you no indication of the direction it's moving in, so we're talking about a scalar here. So the first movement of 2 metres means it could be anywhere in this circle here, so it's a circle with radius 2 metres. And then with this other move of 2 metres, that means it could be anywhere in this giant circle here. So that's giving you an incredibly vague direction, which isn't very helpful. So the way to get around this is to use a vector, and the vector quantity of distance is called displacement. So it gives you the magnitude, so the two meters, and it gives you a direction, so in this case, due east. So if we have an object, it's moved two meters due east, so that puts it on the edge of this circle here. And then 2 metres due north would put it somewhere around this location here. And the advantage of that is it's a very specific location it's moved to rather than this general area which it could occupy. So, how do we give direction? Well, one of the ways of doing that is using bearings. So these are used by both the nautical and the aviation industry. Obviously, it would have been originally a naval thing because aeroplanes were invented a lot later than boats. And it's a way of giving directions in using a sort of a uniform system which everybody uses so everyone knows which way all of the boats are going. So bearings have a few key principles. They're always given from north, so said move on a bearing of 20 degrees, it's 20 degrees from north. And it's 20 degrees clockwise from north, so we're going round this way. So north through east, round south and through west. And you're usually giving them as a three digit number, so if you're doing 90 degrees, that's only a two digit number, so you give it as 090. It just means there's no margin for error, so somebody doesn't end up going at 900 degrees or something like that. And so an object moving east, given that it's going from north and measured clockwise, would be going at 0, 090 0 degrees bearing. And one moving west, going all the way around clockwise, would be going at 270 degrees there. So that's bearings. And you will come across other systems for giving direction, like to the horizontal or to the vertical or something like that. But this is a uniform one that the whole world uses the same. Okay, let's have a look at a few more vectors and scalars, some of which you'll have come across before. Okay, so in terms of the vectors and scalars, you, we've talked about distance and displacement already. The other one you'll have come across already is speed, so going at 6 metres per second. Or you can have velocity, which is the vector, so you'll be going at 6 metres per second due north, or 6 metres per second at an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical. Something along those lines giving you an indication of the direction. The problematic one is acceleration, because unfortunately the same terminology is used for both the vector and the scalar equivalent. You have to be very careful as to whether you're being given just a magnitude, which would mean you were dealing with this scalar here, or if you're given the magnitude and the direction. So if it's gravity, for instance, you would know the magnitude, 9.8, and you'd also know the direction, which would be towards the centre of the Earth, or usually vertically down when dealing with projectiles. So you have to be a little bit careful with acceleration, because the terminology used is the same. Okay, so let's have a look at doing some calculations to actually calculate these various properties. So these things here, displacement, distance, velocity, etc., are known as properties of a material. Okay, so if we don't know what the velocity is, we have a couple of ways of calculating it. So the first one that you should be familiar with 
is the velocity is the rate of change of displacement. You'll have known it as speed equals distance over time. Well, moving into our new world of vectors, velocity is the rate of change of displacement, or the change in displacement divided by the time in which that change occurred. And that's expressed mathematically like this. So v is velocity, s is displacement, and t is time. You can also calculate the velocity of an object from the acceleration in time. So your change in velocity is going to be the acceleration during the change in time multiplied by the time over which it was accelerating. So those are two ways you've got of calculating velocity. We only have one method for calculating our acceleration. It's the rate of change of velocity and that's expressed in this equation here. And we can also calculate the distance an object has traveled because it's the product of velocity and the time at which the object was at that velocity. So we've got this one here, and you'll notice it's a rearrangement of this equation up here. So these equations all come from graphs. It's really important to make that distinction. A lot of people think we've got this equation so it makes this graph. It's no, it's not like that. We've just got the graph and these properties all came from those graphs. So it makes sense to have a look at those graphs. Okay, so we've got a displacement against time graph. And this one is at constant velocity because the rate of change or the gradient of this graph is constant. Now these are the easiest ones to deal with because it's simply a case of working out the gradient of the line, so dy by dx. And a key thing I want to draw your attention to is when you're doing this, even though it's a straight line, you want to be using the majority of your graph. So this is something that's very much encouraged in science, and obviously math is used extensively in science, so it's something you need to get into the habit of. Okay, so what I've done here, we've got a triangle drawn on here. We've calculated the change in y, so we've got 8 minus 2, so it gives you 6. And we've got our change in x, so we've got 4 minus 1 gives you 3. So then that would mean you get a velocity of dy over dx gives you 2.0 meters per second here. Nice and easy there. We've got a straight line graph. Slightly more complicated is if we don't have a straight line graph, so velocity isn't constant. It's going to be varying. So that might look a little bit like this. So as I say at the bottom here, the key thing here is if you want to find the velocity at a certain point, you need to draw a tangent to the graph at that point. So that's that this green line here. Essentially, it's a line that has the same gradient as the graph at the particular point. So once you've drawn your tangent, it's exactly the same principle as before. We calculate the change in y, the change in x using the majority of this line, and then you can calculate your velocity. So that's how to deal with a non-straight line graph. Okay, so that's using displacement versus time graphs. Let's move on to look at how we can do some other calculations. So in both of the previous examples, we were using the gradient of the line. That's because we had a displacement versus time graph, and velocity is the gradient of that graph, because it's the rate of change. What if we have a velocity versus time graph, and we want the displacement? So if we remember before, to get our displacement, it's sort of the product of your velocity and your time. But the problem is here, that your velocity is constantly changing. So how do we deal with that? Well, graphically, the product of the two variables is the area under the graph. So if we want the displacement from a velocity time graph, we need to calculate the area under it. And again, we have a simpler example here. So what we can do is, because it's a straight line, we can model it as a triangle, and that will give us a very accurate answer. So the area of a triangle is half times your base, so half times 5 and then multiply by your height, so that's where the 10, and that gives you a displacement of 25 meters over five seconds. So that's the simpler one, and as always, there's a slightly more complex if it's not a straight line graph. 
If, however, your velocity is constantly changing, as before, but it's not got a constant gradient, so again, your acceleration is changing in this case, if the gradient of your velocity time graph is changing. So what you have to do here is use a model to try and get an approximation here. So what I've done is I've divided this graph up into lots of trapezia here. So I've taken, see where the graph is, a curved section here, I've turned it into a straight line type graph. It's a good way of getting an approximation and there are slightly better ways which you'll come across as you work through A-level maths, but this is a very good approximation at this stage. So to get the area of a trapezium, first of all you multiply the base here, so it's it's the same as also your base, that's where your 1.0 comes from. And then you need the average of the two sides. That's why you've got this half times half times 9 plus 8.5. You're calculating the average of your two sides, and that gives you the area of this trapezium here. So if we want to get the total area, we just have to add together the areas of all of these individual trapezia. And that allows us to calculate an approximation for the displacement in this case. The thing to be aware of is whether you're making an overestimate or an underestimate. So we can see these green lines always cut off a little section of your graph here. So that means your answer is going to be a slight underestimate for the displacement and that's something to be aware of when you're trying to make practical use of this kind of thing. Okay, so those are some of the key principles you're going to need for the mechanics. And I'm going to move on in the next video to look at resolving and combining vectors. That's an important skill you're going to need in Mechanics 1.